طيب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إلى علمنا اللهم نسلك علما نافع وعملا صالح ما بعد ف We'll continue, inshallah, with our reading from the book known as the Musannaf of Abdul Razak ibn Hammam al-San'ani, rahimahullah ta'ala, who passed away in the year 211 after the Hijrah. Rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'ah. And we're in the book known as Kitab al-Siyam, the book regarding fasting. And we talked about the fact that the Musannafat the books that are known as Musannafat, those books that deal with the statements of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Atba' al-Tabi'een, that they are a resource for the Muslim to understand the religion the way the Salaf understood the religion. The Salaf being the Sahaba, the Tabi'een and the Atba' al-Tabi'een. وَقُلُوا مَنْ تَقَدَّمَنَا And everybody who preceded us in Islam and in righteousness and in understanding. But that being said, we said that these type of books, they're not meant to be independent from the books of Hadith. So if the book of Hadith is the evidence that we base on, i.e. the Quran and the Sunnah, then the books like the Musannafat are meant to show us how to understand the Sunnah and how the Salaf understood the Sunnah, whether they all agreed to it in its understanding or whether they had different understandings about how to implement it. And we say that one of the main things with regards to the way of the Sahaba is that it is necessary upon us to worship Allah the way that they did. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ السُّفَهَا أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ السُّفَهَا وَلَكِنْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, speaking about the Munafiqeen, he said, and when it is said to them, i.e. those who have hypocrisy, have faith the way the people have faith. And the people during the time of the Prophet that had faith were the Sahaba. And we all know that faith, it is our belief, as well as our actions, as well as our statements. So it's necessary for the Muslim to believe and to act and to say, the way the Sahaba did. When it was said to those hypocrites, have faith the way the people have faith, they said, Will our faith be like the faith of those foolish individuals? So we see that the people who rejected the Sahaba and rejected their way, they had in them this hypocrisy. And they considered the way of the Salaf to be a way of the fool. Allah Azza wa Jalla says about them, "Ala inna hum humus sufaha." Indeed, instead, it is them who are the foolish. Walakin la yalamu, but they don't know. So it's necessary upon us that we use these books of the Sahaba as a resource to help further our understanding, and that we worship Allah the way the Sahaba did. If they all agreed, then that's the religion, and if they disagreed then the religion is one of the choices that they made. The religion doesn't go outside of the way of the Sahaba. If they had an opinion about something, then the religion is inside of their opinion. The evidence of that is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَنْ يُشَاقِكَ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ and whoever separates himself from the messenger and follows a way other than the way of the believers. And the believers that are referred to in this ayat are the Sahaba. Allah says, we will turn him to what he has turned to and we will burn him in the hellfire and what an evil place to end up. So it's necessary to follow their way. If they were all agreed about that way, then the religion is that way. And if they disagreed, then the religion is inside of their disagreement. Because there's no other way to make Allah happy except by following them. 
Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, السابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنه ورضوا عنه وأعد لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز العظيم ولا كبير The point is, is that Allah Azza wa Jal, he said that and whoever Allah Azza wa Jal, he said the first and the foremost from the muhajirin and the ansar and those who follow them in perfection, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. And he has prepared for them rivers underneath which rivers flow. Uh, that is the great success. The point is, is that Allah is not pleased with anyone other than the Sahaba and the Ansar. And these were the first groups of the Sahaba. These were the first groups of the Sahaba. No, I that controls the Bible. These were the first groups of the Sahaba and Allah mentioned three people that he's pleased with. He said the first and the foremost, i.e. the leaders from the Muhajireen and the Ansar and those that follow them. So the group that is the Ansar have died out and the group that was the Muhajireen have died out. The only group left to be able to receive Allah's pleasure is those who follow them. So this is why we learn the likes of these books. And we're going to see difference of opinions. We're going to see things that we might consider strange. But the reason why we learn this is that so we can understand the religion the way that they understood it. We covered last time the chapter of when a child should be commanded to pray. And then we started talking about the beginning of fasting. I, how do we recognize the beginning of the month? And now we're in a section that the author, he says, Bab faslu ma bayna Ramadani wa Sha'ban. The chapter regarding disconnecting between Ramadan and Sha'ban. And this is because the Salaf, they didn't used to like to connect Ramadan to any other month. They would make Ramadan its own month. They would not fast before Ramadan a day or two or three, and they would not fast after Ramadan, a day or two or three. Obviously, the day before Ramadan, we call this day Yom Ashek, right? The day when it's the 29th day, and we're not sure if the moon was seen or not. That day, which becomes the 30th day of Sha'ban, they call this day the day of Shek. A lot of scholars say that it is haram to fast this day, especially if you seek it out on purpose. And then you have the day after Ramadan, which is the day of the Eid. And fasting the day of the Eid is haram. And then you have the day before the day of doubt, the day before the 28th of Sha'ban, for example. The Prophet Sallallahu as we're gonna see, he wouldn't allow you to fast after the 15th of Sha'ban, if you weren't doing so before. And when it came to Shawwal, the month after Ramadan, they would stop a couple of days fasting to enjoy, to receive guests. It's a time for people might come by and visit you. So it's not a time that you should fast. And we see the mistake how some Muslims after the Eid, the first thing they do is start fasting the six days of Shawwal. And this is against the guidance of the Sahaba. They wouldn't conduct themselves like this. So let's see what their statements were regarding separating between Ramadan and Sha'ban. قال عبد الرزاق أنا بني جريج قال أخبرني عطاء قال كنت عند بني عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما قبل رمضان بيوم أو يومين فقرب غداء فقال أفطروا أيها الصيام لا تواصل برمضان شيء برمضان شيئا 
وافصلوا قال وكان ابن عبد القاري صائما فحسبت انه افطر عبد الرزاق he said that ibn juraij he informed me or he uh, ibn juraij he said about uh ata he said that ata informed me he said that i was with ibn abbas يعني عطاء بن ابي رباح he said i was with ibn abbas before ramadan by a day or two and his meal his lunch was brought close it was presented to him his lunch was brought forward and so he said oh you people who fast all the time asiyam right ya ayyuha asiyam right that scale in arabic fa'al it's the one who does it constantly wallahu fa'alun lima yuri ya ayyuha asiyam you individuals who fast all the time break your fast and do not connect between ramadan and anything else and separate it ibn uh, ata he said and ibn abdul qadi was fasting and I, at that time and i believe he broke his fast right and uh naam and ibn abdul qadi was one who was very close to umar Right, Ibn Abdul Qadi, it was a, a, a tabi'i who was very close to Umar. And he was fasting at that time. And he said, Ata, he said, I believe he broke his fast after the statement of Ibn Abbas. He said, An Ibn Jurajin, Qala akhbarani Amr ibn Dinar, Qala kan ibn Abbasin ya'muru bi fasli baynahuma. On the authority of Ibn Juraj, who said that Amr ibn Dinar, and we said this was one of the major scholars of Medina in Mecca, Amr ibn Dinar. He said that Ibn Abbas he used to command the people to separate between the two. I separate between Sha'ban and Ramadan. قال أن ابن جريج أن أطاء أنه قال سمعت أبا هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه يقول لا تواصل برمضان شيئا وفصل. Ibn Juraij he said on the authority of Ata who said I heard Abu Hurairah saying don't connect anything with Ramadan and separate between it. عن ابن جريج قال قلت لعطاء أيكفيك يوم الفطر أن تفصل به قال لا قال أياما قبله أو بعده ابن جريج he said I said to عطاء عطاء is the one who narrated all of this all of this and if you remember we said one of the things about the مصنف of عبد الرزاق that was different from the مصنف of ابن أبي شيبة is that he preserved for us the fiqh of the people of Mecca. You see a lot of repetition on Ata and Ibn Abbas. These were the scholars of Mecca, and he's preserving that information for us. And he fills it up all the times with questions. He says, "I said to Ata, is it enough for you on the day of Fitr, i.e., the Eid, that you use that as the separation? Is it enough to use the day of Eid as the separation between Ramadan and other than it?" Ata, he said, "La." It has to be days before and days after. Now, he said that, and some of the benefit in that is like we mentioned, people might want to visit you in this time, right? On the Eid, obviously, and one of the mis misconceptions is that the Eid of Fitr has three days. You hear people saying this often. The Eid of Fitr only has one day, right? But that doesn't mean that people won't be visiting you during that time. And if you're already fasting again, then you won't have the time to host them. You won't be able to receive them and enjoy with them. So for this reason, you saw the setup they used to like to separate it, to give people a time to share each other's companionship. He said, قال أخبرنا معمر أن يحيى بن أبي كثير أن أبي سلمة عن ابي هريره رضي الله تعالى عنه انه قال نهى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ان يتعجل شهر رمضان بصوم يوم او يومين الا رجل كان يصوم صوما فياتي ذلك على صوم he said that ma'mar uh, informed us on the authority of yahya ibn abi kathir on the authority of abi salama on the authority of abi hurayra رضي الله تعالى عنه he said that the messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he forbade. Uh, and that's important, right? That prohibition shows that it is haram. 
He said that the messenger of Allah forbade that we advance Ramadan or the month of Ramadan in fasting with a day or two. Unless it was a person who had a fast that he was normally doing and that normal fast happened to fall a day or two before Ramadan. I.e., for example, a person who used to fast Mondays and Thursdays. If that was your normal habit, that you would fast Mondays and Thursdays, and the 28th or the 29th of Ramadan was a Monday or a Thursday, then it is okay to fast it. But besides that, the Messenger وسلم, forbade. Or if an individual used to fast every other day, the fast of Dawood, Obviously, one of those days would be a day or two before Ramadan. And so it was okay to fast that. But other than that, then no. He says, أَخْبَرُنَا مَعْمَرْ أَنْ قَتَادَ أَنْ نَبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ قَالَ إِفْصِلُوا بَيْنَ شَعْبَانِ وَشَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ بِفِطْرِ يَوْمٍ أَوْ يَوْمَيْنِ أَوْ نَحْوِ ذَلِكَ He says that Ma'mar said about Qatada, who said that the Prophet, and this is Mursal, Qatada was a tabi'i. He didn't meet the Prophet. But it's something that shows us the understanding of the Salaf. He said that the Prophet وسلم, he said, separate between Sha'ban in the month of Ramadan by breaking your fast for a day or two or something similar to this. Qala akhbaruna ma'marun an ayyub an ibn Sirin annu qala asbahu yawman shakina fi siyam. وذلك في رمضان فغدوت إلى أنس بن مالك فوجدته قد غدا لحاجتي فسألت أهله فقلت أصبح صائما أو مفطرا قالوا قد شرب خزيرة ثم غدا قال ثم دخلت على مسلم بن يسار فدعا بالغدا قال فلم أدخل يومئذ على رجل من أصحابنا إلا رأيته مفطرا إلا رجلا واحدا وددت لو لم يكن فعل قال وأراه كان يأخذ بالحساب He says on the authority of Ma'mar on the authority of Ayyub on the authority of Ibn Sirin right? Ma'mar Ibn Rashid major scholar Ayyub al-Sakhtayani major scholar and Muhammad Ibn Sirin was somebody who was comparable to Sa'id Ibn Musayyib right? from the major scholars from the Tabi'een of the people of Basra one who learned the skill of interpreting dreams from Abu Bakr, from the older Tabi'een. He said that the people woke up one day unsure whether to fast. Asbaha yawman shakina fasiyam. Meaning they woke up that morning and they weren't sure if the moon was sighted. In their area, it was cloudy or something stopped them from seeing it. And no news had come from anywhere else yet. So they woke up unsure what they should do. And if we remember in the last chapter, the prophet taught us what? Fast when you see it and break your fast when you see it. And if it's concealed from you, i.e. the seeing of the moon, then complete the month as 30 days. That 30th day is what we call the day of doubt, Yom Shek. And so the people walk, woke up in that day unsure about fasting, right? And it's important to remember, like, put yourself in those circumstances. Of course, we have all of this information now. We have books, widespread, every library. But these Muslims are early on in Islam, right? Some of them have information, some of them don't. And we see the importance of knowledge and scholarship. If I didn't know a hadith, I don't know what to say. And so for that reason, you'll find people disagree, not knowing what to do because the information hadn't reached them. And this is how a person learned. They learned from, like we talked about before, from the events happening and from the mistakes being made and somebody teaching them and correcting them. So Muhammad Ibn Sirin, he said, the people woke up one day in doubt about whether to fast or not. And that was regarding Ramadan, i.e. before Ramadan, right? That was about Ramadan, Aisha, they fast. Is it Ramadan or not? He says, So I went out that morning to Anas ibn Malik, the Sahabi, the one known as the servant or the 
assistant of the messenger, Khadim al Rasulillah, right? The one who used to help the Prophet, وسلم, Anas ibn Malik, one of the seven who narrated the most hadith, right? Only behind Abu Huraira. He's number two in amount. He said that, so I went out that morning to Anas ibn Malik, and I found him, he had already left. I found that he had already left to take care of some of his business. So I asked his family, when he woke up, was he fasting or did he break his fast? They said he had drunk some khazira. And the khazira is a type of corn meal that you put milk in it and you make like a, a dish out of it, like a crushed corn meal with milk and it make a dish out of it. They said he, has, he had drunk some khazira this morning and then he went out to handle his affairs. He said, I, Muhammad ibn Sirin, he said, and then I went to Muslim ibn Yasar and he was calling that his food be brought to him. He said, and I didn't go to anyone on that day from our friends, i.e. from the people that we learned from. And I, I like this statement, min ashabi, now, right? I don't know if you guys were ever into mafia and things like that. They always used to have the statement, the friend, this friend of ours or something like that, right? They stole that from the Muslims, right? Ashabina, right? One, one of our brothers, one of our friends, this friend of ours. He said, I didn't go to anybody from our friends except that I found him breaking his fast. Except one guy. I found one of our teachers, one of our companions was fasting that day. And he said, I wish he didn't do it. I wish he wasn't fasting that day. He says, and I think it's because he used to use calculations, right? So even though they woke up that morning and they are that last night, they couldn't see the moon. Everybody else said, we're not going to fast. But he said, no, the calculations, if you look at last month and the month before, today is Ramadan. And so he fasted. But even with that, Muhammad bin Sirin, he said, I wish he did, right? Naam. The next narration he says, and Thawri and Mansur and Rib'i ibn Hirash and Rajulin and Nuhuqal kana عند Ammar ibn Yasir fil yawm alladhi yushakku fihi fi Ramadan fajaa bi shatin masliya fatanahha rajulun min alqawm faqala udnu faqala inni sa'im wa ma huwa illa sawmun kuntu asumu faqala ma anta tu'minu billahi wal yawm alakhir fat'im he said that on the authority of Thawri, and he's Sufyan al Thawri, major scholar, and Mansur, major scholar, and Rib'i ibn Hirash, another one. He said that a man said, and this narration has an unknown person in it. He said that a man said that we were with Ammar ibn Yasir, that famous Sahabi. Ammar ibn Yasir, right? The famous Sahabi. He said that we were with Ammar ibn Yasir on the day that people are in doubt about it regarding Ramadan. Fi yawm regarding Ramadan. So a sheep was brought that was baked, like a, a grilled sheep, masliya, right? A grilled sheep. So a person stepped away from the group of people. There was a group of people. They brought a sheep for everybody to eat, but somebody went away. And Ammar, he told him, come closer, come here. And the man said, I'm fasting. And the man, he said, and it's nothing more than a fast that I used to do. Right? I used to make this fast all the time. It's, it's a habit of mine. It's not that I'm doing it because of today. It's a fast that I used to make all the time. Ammari told him, Don't you have Iman in Allah in the last day? Eat something. Like that's, I don't know, y'all don't know. That's, that just shows you the methodology. Don't, what does he mean? Don't you have Iman and Allah in the last day eat something? This is a statement of Jonas. Yeah, but he said Iman. And the man, the hadith, the prophet said, unless it's a fast that you were normally doing. He said, don't you got any man in the law on the last day? Eat something. Who's Iman? 
And when said to them, believe like the people. Who the people? Don't you got Iman in Allah? Do what we're doing. You got Iman in Allah? Do what the Sahaba are doing. Eat something. That is Sahibu Rasulullah. Eat some. Right? That just shows you the way that they thought. This mentality that we talk about being on the way of the Sahaba. It's not something we came up with. It's atik. It's old. It's classical. Don't you got any man in the law in the last day? Do what we're doing. Follow us. Listen to me. Right? So he's using it as a safeguard? It's meaning the reason why he might do it, perhaps, is that so people don't get it confused. And this is something to be important about. You can do an action that's permissible for you. But the people who see you because of who you are will think it's part of the religion. Should we let you do it? For example, and this is common, right? Our teacher told us, Sheikh Fala, rahimahullah. He said, when we came home from Kuwait, when we would make salat, all of us would do this. Where's his hand? In your sleeve, right? Is there anything wrong with putting your hand in your sleeve? Right? Just how our hands used to fall. He said, but the common people, when they would see us, they all thought you had to put your hand in your sleeve. Right? Why? Because this is the religious learned man. Look at how he put his hand. It was in his sleeve. Right? You like to make dua after salat. You got a situation at home. Something happened after salat. Allahumma. Right? And you raised your hands in dua. But you're the religious learned man. Should we let you do it? Because people are going to see you and think it's part of the religion. Abu Hurairah, when he would make wudu, he would go up into his arm. And when he would wipe his leg, he would go up into his shin. Somebody saw him. He said, if I knew he was there, I wouldn't have did it. Why? Because he didn't want that person thinking that his action was the religion. And so here you have Amar ibn Yasir. One of the major Sahaba. And you have a person who's not going to eat in his presence on the day of doubt. What would somebody else looking might say? Ahmad ibn Yasser was okay with people fasting on the day of doubt. So instead of letting that person, even though it's a hadith in it, that he could do it, where other people might think it's wrong, I mean, might, might misunderstand it. No, eat something. And this is a good principle in Islam. Remove the possibility of suspicion from your circumstances. Even the messenger of Allah. Even Rasulullah, he some used to do that. He would go out walking at night with his wife. Can you see who she is? Right? It's dark. It's the messenger of Allah. It's nighttime. He's with a woman. Right? The Prophet with Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna hala safiyya. Hey, it's only some Sahaba saw him, started lowering their gaze and walking fast away. He said, no, no, it's just Sophia. I, it's my wife. Don't worry about it. They said, oh, amen, ya Rasulullah. Do you think that we would even think such a bad thing about you, O Messenger of Allah? And so the point is, is that that might be the reason why he told the man to eat. But in any circumstance, it just shows us that faith is what they did. Right? And you see how the religion reached us. If you were there with Ahmad ibn Yasir and he told you to eat, what you gonna do? Oh, this is this Ahmad. This is the one the Prophet Sallallahu his parents, his shuhada, like there, there's so much about this man, so many hadith about his virtue. And he tells you to eat, I'm eat. He knows the messenger of Allah. I'm just a you know a poor guy. I just I just accepted <laughs> Islam not too long ago, right? So it just shows you how they were. Do you just have a class about uh, not raising your hand other than in canoe? Yes and no. We, we said that raising the hands constantly in dua after the salat was not the normal way of the, the salat. But as we said, if you did it just because you wanted to make dua, right now if I want to make dua and raise my hands, can I do it? Yeah. Absolutely. Allahumma gfir lil muslimin. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a dua. And raising the hands in the dua is a sunnah. And Allah's hayy, uh, 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 right? He's shy to return the hand of the slave back empty-handed. 
But after every salat, you see that there's people who raise their hand and dua after every salat. Is that from the religion? We don't know that to be the way that the Sahaba and the Salaf did it. So if you see somebody doing that every time, especially if it's the Imam, that's how innovation starts. I might make a dua for me. That it's a dua that I make all the time for me. Am I saying it's part of the religion? But this dua is for me. Every, every salat because of my, my, my teacher's favor on me or my mother. Every salat I make dua for my mother. Right? Oh Allah, ihdi ummi. Right? Warshid ha ila islam. And I make this dua every salat for me. Because I want Allah to guide my mother. Is that okay? And I'm doing it every salat. I'm not saying it's part of the religion. It's something between me and Allah. Right? But somebody hears me. Right? And I'm the religious learned person. And they say Abdul Hakim used to make dua for his mother every salat. All they did was tell you about me. Is anything wrong? But then the next generation comes and says, and it's preferable to make dua for your mother every salat. They say, why is it preferable? Say, Abdul Hakim did it every salat. And he was a religious learning person. And so you go three generations down and now on all the books it says, and from the sunnah is to make dua for your mother in every salat. And then when a next generation. And I said, we looked in all the books of the Sunnah. We didn't find that in there. Right? And that's how it happened. That's how these things happen. Wait, he says, وَعَنِ الثَّوْرِ أَنْ سِمَاكْ أَنْ عِكْرِمَ أَنْهُ قَالْ رَأَيْتُهُ أَمَرَ رَجُلًا بَعْدَ الظُّهْرِ فَأَفْطَرْ وَقَالَ مَنْ صَامَ هَذَا الْيَوْمِ فَقَدْ عَصَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ عَصَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ He says, on thawri, on simak, on Ikrima, he said, now this is tricky, is Ikrima saying he said, or is Simak saying Ikrima said? If it's Simak saying Ikrima said, then it means Ibn Abbas said. And if it's Ikrima saying, then it is Ikrima said. He says, whichever one it was, whether it was Ibn Abbas or Ikrima, he says, I saw him command a person after Vuhr to break his fast. And he said, whoever fasts this day, then he has disobeyed the messenger of Allah. Meaning a person woke up on that day of doubt fasting and he had already fasted half of the day. And when he saw him, whether it was Ikrimah or more likely Ibn Abbas, he told him, break your fast. Right? Because whoever fasts today is disobeying the messenger of Allah. Play. Qala an al-Thawri and Abi and Abi Abbad and Sa'id al-Makburi and Abi Hurayrah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu anhu qala naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an siyami sittati ayyam qabla Ramadan bi yawm wal adha wal fitr wa thalathata ayyam at-tashriq on the authority of Athori, on Abi Abbad, on Sa'id al-Makburi, on the authority of Abi Hurairah, radiyallahu ta'ala an, he said that the Messenger of Allah forbid fasting six days. Six days it is haram to fast. And this is an important thing to remember. People don't like to think about it. Can worship be haram? Yes. Instead, the foundation is that worship is haram. People like to say, it's just dhikr. What's wrong with making dhikr? If we all just get together, say Allahu Akbar. And everybody, Allahu Akbar. Say Alhamdulillah. And everybody, Alhamdulillah. Can worship be haram? I put on my ihram from my house. Can worship be haram? You're doing it in the wrong manner. Yes. I make salat. Can salat be haram? Yes, salat can be haram. If it does not correspond to the sunnah, then the action is haram. That means a person thinks that they're doing what? Good. Because they think the action is worship. But in reality, what are they getting? Sin. Because the action is haram. Bid'ah. Bid'ah. Now, and that's why bid'ah is so important. Right? 
قل هل ننبئكم بالاخصرين اعمالا الذين ضل سعيهم في الحياه الدنيا وهم يحسبون انهم يحسنون صنعا Allah says in the Quran, shall we not tell you about the biggest losers regarding their actions? The ones who thought they were doing good in this life. I'm sorry. Those who all of their efforts were misguided in this life, but they thought that they were doing good works. It's not enough to want to do good, but not know how. If you want to do good, you have to know how to do good. And that's what will make your actions accepted. Right? Sincerity for Allah and correspondence to the Sunnah. These are the pillars of acts of worship. Every act of worship. It has to be ikhlas and mutaba'ah. It has to be only for Allah and it has to match the Sunnah. If it misses one of these, if it misses ikhlas, what is it? <laughs> if it doesn't have sincerity for Allah, what is it? Shirk. Shirk. And Allah does not forgive that he be given a partner. And if it doesn't match the sunnah, what is it? Bid'ah. Bid ah. And Allah says, what about bid'ah? Showing you how dangerous it is. You see, it goes hand in hand with shirk. Or do they have partners that have legislated for them in the religion what Allah hasn't given permission for? If you worship Allah in a way that you don't have permission, it's very likely that you're going to fall into shirk. Right? Let them be cautious. Those who oppose his, i.e. the messenger's command. The messenger said, do it this way, you do it a different way. That they will be afflicted by a fitna, or they will be afflicted by a painful torment. They say that the fitna here is shirk. The more you're on innovation, the easier it is to fall into shirk. And you don't have to look past the first group of innovators to see that. When we talk about the Jahmiya, their goal was to protect Islam. But they did it using innovation. And then you look at it. What do they end up as? Philosophers, mushrikul, magicians, believing in the stars. Anyway, he says... That the Prophet ﷺ forbade the fasting of six days. Fasting before Ramadan by a day, or fasting a day before Ramadan. Fasting the day of Adha, i.e. Eid al-Adha. And fasting the day of Fitr, i.e. Eid al-Fitr. And fasting the three days of Tashriq. The three days of fasting after Eid al-Adha. I'm sorry, the three days of celebration after Eid al-Adha. They call him Ayyam al-Tashriq. That is the Eid that has three extra days. Right? People always say the three, the Eid got three extra, extra days. It's not Eid al-Fitr. It's Eid al-Adha. And they call those days Ayyam al-Tashriq. Right? And the Prophet said about those days that they are days of eating and drinking. The exception to that is if you're making Hajj, then there is an allowance to fast those three days. But generally speaking, you cannot fast those three days because the Prophet forbade it. He says, قال وأصبح الناس منهم الصائم والمفتر ولم يروا الهلال فجاءهم الخبر بأن قد رؤي الهلال قال فكلم الناس عمر وبعث الأحراس في العسكر من كان أصبح صائما فليتم صيامة فقد وفق له ومن كان أصبح مفترا ولم يذق شيئا فليتم بقية يومي ومن كان أطعم شيئا فليتم ما بقي من يومي وليقضي بعده يوما مكانا فإني قد لعقت اليوم لعقا 
من عسل فأنا صائم ما بقي من يومي ثم أبدله بعد This narration he says that Ibn Juraj informed us uh, about Ibn Juraj he said that Muzahim informed me he said that Umar Ibn Abdul Aziz he addressed the people in his Khilafah and Umar Ibn Abdul Aziz was from the Tabi'een he was the well let's look at the Khulafa right we know the Khulafa al Rashidun. Does everybody know who the Khulafa al Rashidun were? The rightly guided successors of the Prophet? Who are they? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Ali. Anybody else? Hassan. Hassan ibn Ali is from them as well. Right? The Prophet said that Al Khilafat al Rashid, Al Khilafat al Nabu, Ba'di Thalatina Sana. The rightly guided successorship after me is 30 years. And Hassan, and this is from the Tawfiq of Allah, he had the Khilafah for six months. When you add up all of their time, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, when Ali died, radiallahu ta'ala, I know there were six months left in that window. Hassan became the Khalifa. At the end of the six months, he renounced the Khilafah. He gave it to Muawiyah in a year that they called the year of the compromise. Am as So, Hassan actually made the 30 years of the rightly guided successorship. And then after Hassan, there was Muawiyah. Play like Muawiyah, is he from the Khulafa Rashidun? So he's a bad guy, right? Yeah. This is our uncle, Muawiyah, the uncle of the believers, the brother of our mother, Umm Habiba. He used to write the Wahi for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He used to write the Quran, right? The fifth Khalifa, I'm sorry, the sixth Khalifa and the best king of the Muslims. He was the first king, Muawiyah. Right? Why do they call him a king and not the Khulafa al Rashidun? This is from the miracles of the Prophet. Right? He called the first 30 years a Khilafa. And then he said, after that, there will be a kingdom, a kingship. How did it become a kingship? Is that the 30 years? Yeah, but why? What changed? If, if I look at Muawiyah Sahabi, Hassan Sahabi, Abu Bakr Sahabi, what changed that made this one Khilafat al Rashida and this one a kingship? It's not because Muawiyah was a bad guy. It's not like this was a reduction or a criticism of Muawiyah. It's just after the 30 years, it became a kingship. That's, what, that's when uh, the biggest Islamic war happened, right? No, there was bigger wars before that. Safin Jamal with Ali. It's because Muawiyah. The last of the Sahaba. No, he wasn't the last of the Sahaba. To, to, no, he wasn't the last of the Sahaba. No, I'm saying. To be the Khalifa. He wasn't the last of the Sahaba. His son was Habib? No. But he, he wasn't the last. It's because after him, the Khilafah became inherited. He was the son of Ali? No. His son, Yazid, became the Khalifa. So when it comes to being the Khalifa, you can be selected by the people. Right? Like how all the Sahaba selected Abu Bakr. The Prophet didn't specifically say anybody, but he knew. And everybody knew it was going to be Abu Bakr. And he said, Allah refuses to let anybody other than Abu Bakr be the Khalifa. So Abu Bakr became the Khalifa by unanimous consent. And then Abu Bakr, the other way you can become the Khalifa is that you can be appointed. And Abu Bakr appointed Umar. Look, it's not up for debate. It's not a conversation. When I die, Umar's in charge. Right? But was Umar related to Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr chose who? The best suitable candidate. So it wasn't an inheritance. Even though Abu Bakr appointed, he appointed the best person possible. Then when Umar died, he combined between the two. Right? He said, there are seven people that Allah is happy with on earth. I know for sure. I know seven people for sure that Allah is happy with. They were the remaining 10 that the prophet promised paradise. Uthman, Ali, Talha, 
عبد الرحمن بن عوف سعد بن أبي وقاص and Sa'id ibn uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufay, his cousin. Bilal wasn't in this hadith of these 10 people. This, these 10 people are known as the 10 people who were promised paradise. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abu, Ju, Abu Ubaid uh, ibn al-Jarrah, who had died already. And Aisha, she said, if Abu Ubaid was alive, none of this would have been an issue. SubhanAllah. Because Abu Ubay was known as what? Amin al ummah. She said if Abu Ubay was alive, he'd have been the Khalifa. And it doesn't mean that Abu Ubay was better than Uthman. But it just means that Aisha said, no, this, this person, the Prophet, called him the Amin of this ummah. If he had been alive, I know for sure her opinion is that he would have been the Khalifa. But he had already died. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abu Ubay. Abu Ubaidah, Ibn al-Jarrah. Then we had Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Talha, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and Sa'id ibn Amr ibn Nufay. So out of those 10, three of them had already died. Abu Bakr, Uthman, I mean Abu Bakr, Umar, and Abu Ubaidah. Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufay was Umar's cousin. He said he's out the running. He doesn't get a chance. Right? Umar was like that. I'm not, I'm not going to let anybody say that I'm giving it to my family. What do we say? If you're the person in charge, you're religious, you got, sometimes you might have to treat yourself harsher, things that are okay, but you can't be seen to be doing something in a wrong way. So he took his cousin out of the running and that left six. Uthman, Ali, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Talha, and Zubair. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was away, if I'm not mistaken, or Talha was away, one of the two was away. And one of them said, I don't want it. Abdul Rahman said, look, I don't want it at all. And so that left four. Ali, Uthman, Uthman, Ali, uh, Zubair, and whichever one wasn't away, whether it was Sa'ad or Talha. Zubair gave his candidacy to Ali. And the other one gave it to Uthman. And that left two. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf said, will you all let me choose? Are you all comfortable in letting me select between the two of you? They said yes. And so Abdul Rahman, he said, I asked everybody. There was not nobody I didn't ask. And they all to a person said Uthman. And so Uthman became the next Khalifa. The point is, is that this succession was done by what? By appointing and by selection, by nomination, right? By voting. So we see the two ways that you can become a ruler, by appointing or by selection. After that, Ali became the Khalifa by selection, right? The people selected Ali and the people selected Hassan. And Hassan appointed Muawiyah. Like, up until this point, it's a Khilaf or Rashida. But when Muawiyah became the Khalifa, it is said that it was supposed to go back to Hassan after that. When he died, it was supposed to go back to Hassan. And there's a disagreement there. But Muawiyah appointed his son. This is the first time that it was appointed on blood and lineage, not necessarily looking at all of the candidates. And so Muawiyah appointed his son and that's how it became a kingdom. And this is the beginning of Bani Umayyah, the Umayyad dynasty in Islam. And then when Yazid died, he had a son named Muawiyah. Muawiyah ibn Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Muawiyah the second, he said, I don't want it. Go find yourself a Khalifa. And during this time, there was instability, right? Some people hadn't agreed with Yazid being placed in charge. And they were trying to subdue the dissent. From the people who dissented or were seen as dissenters, whether they dissented or not, was Abdullah ibn Zubair, the Sahabi. He was in Mecca. And so people were fighting against him in Mecca under the authority of Yazid. When Yazid died 
and Muawiyah reclined it or re renounced it, declined it. The people who were fighting against Abdullah bin Zubair, they stopped fighting and said, you should be the Khalifa. You should be the Khalifa. You deserve it. You're the best person left. Sahabi, right? And not only did they say you should be the Khalifa, they said, come back to Damascus with us because that's where the capital was moved to. We'll make sure everybody gets in line. He said, no, I'm gonna stay here in Mecca. This is where my capital is. But he took the pledge of obedience and everybody fell in line except a small group of Bani Umayyah under the leadership of Marwan ibn al-Hakam. And that's the fighting that started between them. And Marwan ibn al-Hakam and his group ended up being victorious. And Abdullah bin Zubair was killed. But he was the seventh Khalifa. He was the seventh. Five. Muawiyah six. Yazid seven. He was the eighth Khalifa. Then you had Marwan ibn al-Hakam, number nine. Because I know y'all forgot where we were going. Then Marwan had a son, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. A major ruler, a knowledgeable ruler, a scholar in Islam. And he had four sons. And he wanted the Khilafah to go to each of his sons after him. So it went to two of them, right? I believe it was Walid and then Suleiman. But then they asked Suleiman, he did something nice. He said, you know what? The people are un unhappy because of events that had taken place up to this point. What should I do? They said, you know what? You got to make Umar ibn Abdul Aziz the Khalifa. It's his cousin, right? He's from Bani Umayyah too, but he wasn't from the children of Abdul Malik. He was from Abdul Malik's brother, Abdullah. I mean, Abdul Aziz, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And he was a descendant of Umar ibn al-Khattab. But he was a scholar and he was knowledgeable and he was fair. They said, you know what you got to do to get things right? We know your dad said your brother should be the Khalifa, but make Umar the Khalifa. And he said, you know what? It's done. And so he appointed Umar ibn Abdul Aziz as the Khalifa after him. And in the two years that Umar was the Khalifa, he repaid all of the oppression that was done before him. And the Muslims reached a, a, a richness that they hadn't reached before. And for that reason, you find a lot of people that used to say about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that he was the fifth rightly guided uh, Khalifa, right? And even though that's a statement that they repeat all the time, we say, okay, was he better than Muawiyah? Let Muawiyah Sahabi. Now the Tabiri, Muawiyah is better. Was he better than Hassan? Kalla wallah, right? Abada. This is Hassan, the grandson of the Prophet. These are Khulafa who are better than him. But out of the rest of them, Allah knows best, he might have been the best. The best of the kings was Muawiyah. Muawiyah was the first of the Muslim kings and the best of them. Sahabi, right? Abdullah bin Zubair was also the Khalifa. He was from the Muslim kings, right? Sahabi also, right? Seven of the Khulafa were Sahaba. Seven of the Khulafa were Sahaba, and then after them, perhaps the best was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And a lot of them were scholars. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan was a scholar in Islam, right? Don't, don't think because he was the Khalifa, he was just like a, a, a evil, nasty. No, he was a scholar in Islam. Abu Ja'far, right? The, the, the second or third Khalifa from Bani Abbas was a scholar. Right? These people were like raised upon knowledge. Even Ma'moon was a scholar. These people knew the religion. But, so Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he addressed the people during his Khilafah. He said, oh people, pay attention to the crescent moon of Ramadan. If you see it, then fast. And if you don't see it, then complete the count 30 days. We all know that. He said, so the people woke up on that day some of them were fasting, some of them were breaking their fast. Right? This is because maybe some people didn't reach them the verd, the edict, the judgment of the ruler, or maybe they had a, a conflicting Islamic opinion, or maybe they just didn't know. And this is something that shows us that things that are allowed to disagree about, we're allowed to disagree about. And it doesn't make enmity amongst us. This guy. And he, look at what he's, the people who woke up fasting that day. According to us, what did they do? 
Fasted on the 20, 29th day? The 30th day. The 30th. Oh, they, what did they do? They disobeyed the prophet. According to the people who have the other opinion, they disobeyed the prophet. The people who didn't fast that day, according to the people who did fast, what did they do? Disobeyed who? No. Disobeyed Allah. Because Allah said, fast Ramadan. And in their mind, it's Ramadan. So you got one group of people saying, you disobeying Allah. And you got another group of people saying, you disobeying the prophet. Did it make them fight? Did it make them hate each other, enemies? Right? This is how we work. If you got an evidence and you believe your evidence, I tolerate that from you. Right? You don't have to agree with me for us to be brothers. You just have to do it the correct way. You have to get your religion the same way I get mine. Your results might be different, but did we follow the right path to get it? So he said some of the people woke up fasting and some of the people woke up breaking their fast and they hadn't seen the moon the night before. Then information came that the moon was saw, that the moon had been seen. Maybe somebody was out of town traveling. And on the way to the city, he saw the moon. When he gets to the city, he says, yeah, I seen it last night in this area where they couldn't see it in Medina or wherever they were at. And so he said, okay, it was Saul. This person who told us is reliable, everybody. Today is Ramadan. But you have some people who woke up fasting and some people who woke up not fasting. What do we do? So he said, then it was informed that the moon had been seen. So Omar addressed the people again. He said, and he sent the soldiers to the army camps to tell the people, right? Send the soldiers out to the camps in various locations so that everybody in the Muslim kingdom knows. Whoever woke up fasting, then let him keep fasting. Yeah, I told you not to fast today if you didn't see it, but you woke up fasting. فَقَدْ وُفِّقَ لَهُ that's from the success that Allah gave you. You happen to wake up fasting and you're fasting. So you can keep fasting as if it's Ramadan. And whoever woke up and they weren't fasting, their intention was not to fast, but they haven't tasted anything yet. Then let them fast the rest of their day. Right? You haven't eaten anything yet. And you know from this moment, now you know. And since you know now, your Ramadan starts now. Don't eat anything else. And that's enough, inshallah. How about the niyyah? Ah, about the niyyah. What do you get from this? <laughs> right, so they woke up breaking their fast. But then they got knowledge that today is Ramadan. What should they do? Fast. They should fast. طيب. But they didn't fast the first hours of the day. Nia follows knowledge. When did they figure out it was Ramadan? Not when they woke up. It might have been Dhuhr, it might have been before Dhuhr, it might have been after Dhuhr. Now that they have knowledge, when does their Ramadan start? Right then and there. Their Ramadan starts now. Right? Because before knowledge, did Ramadan start? And are you held accountable for things before knowledge? And so, for example, a person accepts Islam in the middle of the day of Ramadan. What does he do? Starts fasting. Do we tell him to make that day up? Because his obligation started. How about if he already ate breakfast? Ah, we didn't get there yet. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he said, if you woke up and you didn't eat anything, right? Then complete the rest of your day. And obviously there's disagreement in this, but this is just showing us how some of the Salaf would say it. This is a big issue about what to do. He said, and as far as those who have eaten something, you woke up, your intention was to break your fast and you've already eaten. Then fast the rest of your day. Fast the rest of the day and make the day up. As far as me, then I had some honey. This morning I woke up, I had a, a spoonful of honey, if you will, right? 
So I'm going to fast the rest of the day and I'm going to make another one up. Why do I have to fast the rest of the day? Because it's Ramadan. And I don't have no reason not to fast. It's Ramadan. I know it's Ramadan. I've already eaten. When I ate, was I sinning? I was excused. I didn't know. But now I know. Do I have a reason not to fast? I got to fast. Play. Did I fast that day of Ramadan? Not all of it. So I got to make it up. Right? And so that's what he would do. Obviously, this issue is something that scholars disagree about. What do you do? But this shows you that Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, what his method was, if you didn't eat, you can fast. If, if you didn't know the day was Ramadan and then you found out later and your intention was already to fast, you can change your intention to something else. You see what I'm saying? If you were fasting for another reason and then you found out it was Ramadan, you can change your intention to something else. If you hadn't eaten, did you have to make your intention the night before? If you didn't know and you hadn't eaten and then the knowledge got to you, you can make your intention right there and that day counts. Because you haven't done something that would count as breaking your fast. Other schools of thought would say no. You have to have the intention the night before and make that day up. If you had already eaten, can you fast? You can't fast that entire day because you've already eaten. And so therefore, you have to make that day up. The question is, do you have to fast the rest of that day? Yes. And according to Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he says yes. Right? Because you have no reason not to fast. And some people would say, no, you don't have to fast. And some people would say, you don't have to make that day up. But this shows you what some of the Salaf would do. Right? And if you don't know anything else, you know this now. Right? Does that mean it's the final answer? Does that mean nobody disagreed? But if you don't know anything else, you know this now. And so if you find yourself in a situation one day where you don't know, it, you didn't know it was Ramadan and then you found out, you say, oh, you know what? I remember what Umar Ibn Abdelaziz did. He said, if you didn't fast, if you woke up fasting, you can continue. And if you didn't eat, you can fast the rest of the day. But if you did eat, start fasting and make the day up. And as you get more knowledge, you'll see what somebody else said. And then it'll be your job to determine whose opinion was right. I.e. when you have the capability of doing so. Now, he says, قال عبد الرزاق عن ابن جريج عن عطاء قال إذا أصبح رجل مفطرا ولم يذق شيئا ثم علم برؤيته أول النهار أو آخره فليسمى بقية ولا يبدله. Ah, subhanallah. We didn't have to wait long to figure out something else. And that's why these books are good. Because the authors, they bring the various statements. Uh, Ibn Juraj, he said on Ata. Ata, that scholar of Mecca. He said, if a person wakes up not fasting, you woke up, you weren't fasting. But you hadn't eaten anything yet. And then you find out it's Ramadan. Whether it was in the early morning or in the end of the day, you found out nine o'clock. You found out now. All day you was busy, you hadn't eaten, you hadn't drunk anything all day. You just found out, because you gotta remember back then, they didn't have cell phones, television, right? And for the day to be considered Ramadan, who has to declare it? The people in charge. So say for instance, I'm in charge of this city. I went out last night. We went out. We didn't see the moon. But Labib, he was out. He was in a place where it wasn't cloudy. He saw the moon. He has to get all the way to town. Find me. Tell me. I have to announce it. And then that information has to reach all of y'all. It's not a WhatsApp group. We can just tell everybody right away. Right? Somebody has to go to the market and announce, hey, Abdul Hakim said today is Ramadan. And then your cousin heard it. And he has to tell his wife. And his wife tells your sister. And your sister tells you, right? How long does that take? It could take a while for that information to get to you. So whether you heard about it in the beginning of the day 
or in the end of the day, but you hadn't eaten anything yet. This is the statement of Apa. Then let him fast what's left of the day and he doesn't have to replace it. That's good enough. You hadn't eaten yet? Just fast from this moment and you don't have to make it up. As long as you got a what? A piece of the day. Whether it was before Dhuhr or after. Some scholars say no, that only counts until Dhuhr. After Dhuhr, no. Well, we say why? When did the knowledge reach me? If I found out right now, 614, is it still the, the day of Ramadan? Yep. And somebody walks in, kicks the door open. Salam alaikum Muslims. The ruler just said today is Ramadan. Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah. Hey, did you eat? No, I ain't ate nothing yet. I'm fasting. Akhi, what you gonna do about the, the, the day though? You gonna make it up? Well, you know, Alpha said, and Omar ibn Abdul Aziz said, I don't have to, right? Why don't you have to? Because I fasted the day of Ramadan. I haven't eaten anything all day. Well, you didn't make your niyyah last night. I made my niyyah once I knew. And I haven't done anything to break it, so I'm okay. This is the disagreement about the issue of do you have to make your niyyah the night before? Absolutely, there's a hadith in that issue. And absolutely, if you know, you should make your intention the night before. That way you get the entire day. But if you didn't know, are you held accountable for what you didn't know? And once you knew, when did your Ramadan start? As soon as you knew. Had you done anything that betrayed that fasting yet? So start fasting. And you can make, you don't have to make up that day. We did address it. These people who woke up not fasting, did they make the intention to fast? No, they, didn't. they didn't. They made the intention. I'm not fasting today. They just happened to not have eaten anything. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So they're not eating. Was it worship? Was it fasting? Like right now, I'm, okay, that's a bad example. We're all not eating because we're fasting. When you wake up, you stretch, you yawn, you go, you make wudu. Have you eaten anything yet? No. Is it because you're fasting? No. It's just because you ain't got around to it yet. You go, you make salat, you put on your clothes, you get ready to go to work, you're driving to work. Have you eaten anything yet? No. Just because you haven't gotten around to it. You told yourself, I'm going to go stop at Starbucks and get a coffee before I get to the office. You get to Starbucks, the line is long. I'm going to be late. I got to go. Have you eaten anything yet? No. Just you ain't got around to it. You get to work. I thought about it. I'm not fasting. So that means you're not fasting. I'm not fast. I'm not fasting. I went to Starbucks. They just line was long. I go to work. I got a lot of work to do. I'm not going to get off until I get lunch break. I'm going to go to McDonald's at lunch, inshallah. Lunchtime comes. Hey. I need you to finish this document. Oh, subhanAllah, I want to go get something to eat. Right? Still not eating yet. Is it because I'm fasting? No. no, I just haven't got a chance to. Then, later on that day, I didn't think today was Ramadan. Later on that day, I get home. I'm about to pray Asa. And my family tells me, hey, you heard the, today is Ramadan. They didn't announce it last night. They didn't, nobody came with the information. But somebody told them just now today is Ramadan. You say what? Allahu Akbar. I haven't eaten nothing. I'm fasting. Do I got to make that day up? No. According to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Alpha, you're good. Because have you eaten today? Even though your intention wasn't to fast earlier, it's because you didn't know. What's but you're not eating it or drinking it. Huh? What's the likelihood you Absolutely eat? high. <laughs> Absolutely high. As a truck driver, it happens to us all the time. We wake up, we got a load that we got to deliver. And drink. And drinking. And drink water. And drinking. We got a load we got to deliver. I don't have time. I got to be there at five. I don't have time to take my break. I'm, I'm gunning. And we're used to it. But I'm going to get there. When I get there, I'm going to get something to eat, get something to drink. But I'm gunning. I don't take a bathroom break. I'm going to combine when I get there. I'm not doing nothing but driving this load because I know if I get there late, they're going to tell me, and it's Juma. if I get there late, they're going to tell me I got to wait till Monday. I'm not sitting on this load all weekend. I'm going. I'm not stopping. If I can run a light, I'm running the light. <laughs> right? And then I get... Huh? Is it worse for Ramadan time? No. Voluntary fast is not even an issue. So let's just say I wake up uh, after Ramadan. 
voluntary fast, it's not even an issue. The prophet used to all the time tell his wives, is there any food? I'm fasting. Oh, you can do that? Of course, involuntary. The argument is about mandatory fasting because, and all of this connects to an issue of is fasting necessary for the entire day? Do you have to have the intention for the entire day? Or do you just have like, and we'll, we'll talk about it some, but these are the things, like for example, right now you're in the masjid, right? What's your intention for being here? At your high. Okay, it's the house of Allah. Congratulations. How are you getting at you? Seeking knowledge. I went to the masjid for the class. I'm getting at you. What else? I'm waiting for salat. Waiting for one salat to the next is Ejir. What about Etikaf? You guys know Etikaf, right? Yeah. Can I make my Nia to be for Etikaf right now? A lot of scholars say yes. What is Etikaf? Etikaf is staying in the masjid and not doing anything else. I'm in the masjid. I'm not doing anything else. But the question is, does Etikaf have to be the whole day or not? And that's a similar conversation to fasting, right? Right now I'm in the masjid, I'm not doing anything else. Can I make it to calf? Or do I have to stay in here from Maghrib till Fajr? I mean, from Maghrib to Maghrib, right? And so that's a similar conversation about fasting. I haven't eaten anything. Can I fast this portion of the day? And that portion of the day get me the reward for fasting? Or do I actually have to actually fast intention as well for the whole 24 hours or for the whole however many hours. Voluntary fast, it's not an issue. You can fast for a portion of the day, right? If you woke up, let's say for instance, you work the night shift and you go home at fudger time and you sleep in the winter until right before Maghrib and you wake up, what should you do? I'm fasting. I'm fasting. What you get? Edger, it's only five minutes left in the day. What you mean you fasting? Yalla yachi, I'm fasting. Fasting all day. I've been fasting all day. <laughs> right? There's a hadith that talks about that? Yeah, the prophet used to go to his wife. And a lot of sahaba. Any food? I'm fasting. What was he going to do if there was food? He's going to eat. Wasn't no food. I'm fasting. The issue is in the obligatory prayer. I'm sorry, in the obligatory fast, do you have to have your intention the entire obligatory period? And the answer is yes. That's why we say you have to have your intention the night before. Yes. But do you have to act, meaning at the beginning of Ramadan, what did you make? The intention to fast the month of Ramadan. The to fast the month of Ramadan. So there's not a moment in the month of Ramadan that you're telling yourself, I'm not going to fast tomorrow unless... You tell yourself, I'm not going to fast tomorrow. Like if I travel, then I got to remake the intention. But every night, do you have to do a specific thought process of intention? Yeah. No. Waking up for sahur, sufficient intention. Why'd you eat sahur in the morning? Who the intention to fast? That's intention. You didn't have to do a specific set of thoughts. Right? When the beginning of Ramadan, you told yourself what? I'm a fast one along. The decision that you made in your heart, that's the Nia, the decision that you make in your heart. I thought there was a ruling. You have to have the intention the night before. But does your intention go away? No, no, I'm talking about each night. E that's what I'm saying. It doesn't say each night. The hadith says, La siyam li man lam to siyam amin There's no fasting for the one who doesn't make the intention the night before. The question is, is that does your continue... Does your intention continue or stop? When you pray Dhuhr, do you have to make the intention all through Dhuhr that you're praying Dhuhr? No. You, before you pray, you got up, you heard the Iqamah. Why'd you get up? Because it was time for Dhuhr. You're about to pray Dhuhr. When you said Allahu Akbar, why'd you make Rukur? Because it's Dhuhr Rukur. You didn't have to keep making a new intention. So in Ramadan, at the beginning of the month, what did you make the intention? Fast. I'm a fast Ramadan. There is people that do that, right? I do it. Oh, there's a lot of people who go extreme in the intention. Remember, the intention is a decision in your heart. Every action has a niyyah. 
This is a mistake that people think about this hadith. It's not a mistake, but it's an understanding that people don't know about this hadith. A lot of people, not a lot of people, some people. What's that mean? The hadith, you guys know it. Actions are because of intention. What's it mean? That's just the words. What's it mean? What is based on intention? What about the action is based on intention? There's a word missing there in Arabic. Actions are blank because of intention. That's how you would translate it. Are done because of an intention. So what's that mean? Actions are done because of an intention. You did that thing based on something. Most people say that that hadith means actions are accepted because of intention, right? For your action to be accepted, you need a what? Intention. intention. Actions are considered because of intention. You know what action you're doing based on the intention. Is this vor or asr? How do you know? Because of time. Actions are considered because of intention. The only difference between vor and asr is the intention. The salaf, there was a different understanding that they had to this hadith. Actions exist because of intention. That means every action you do, you have a what? You have an intention. So the issue isn't making the intention. The issue is what was your intention? What in the mali kulimriin mano? Why'd you pick that up? You see, every action has an intention. But now, how to make that action worship? Did you pick that up because you have to go home and take care of somebody? That's not my reason, but I have to go. Okay. If, you, if there's an intention that is worship of Allah, picking that up becomes worship. You see what I'm saying? Talk about. If you picked it up because you don't want to leave the house of Allah as a mess, that becomes worship. worship. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So the issue becomes not what is the, not did I have an intention, but what was the intention? So the point of it is, is that when it comes to uh, obligatory, like we said, I don't know, when it comes to obligatory fasting, do you have to have the intention for the entirety of the day? We say yes, because you can't miss a portion of the day, but the obligation follows what? Knowledge. So if I didn't know a portion of the day, did I have to have the intention for that portion? Once I got the knowledge, I make the intention and that is the beginning of my day. And, and, and what they mean by that, you can have the intention to pray Dhuhr when the time comes in, but it's, 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 the issue is, is that the knowledge, my obligation doesn't start until I have knowledge. Just like you can have the knowledge, the intention that when Ramadan comes, I'm a fast, but you don't think it's Ramadan yet. And you are justified in not thinking it's Ramadan. But once you found out it was Ramadan, you have to what? You have to fast. And have you done anything that breaks your fast before that? Then your fast is accepted because you did what was necessary when it was necessary. Right. Boy, uh, I had lost my page for a second. OK, here we go. He said, so Alpha said you just fast from that moment and you don't have to replace it. And Ma'mar and Ata al Khurasani and Ibn al Musayyib, Mithla. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he said the same thing. If you hadn't eaten and you find out at any point in the day, you just start fasting from that point. And this happened during the time of the Prophet. They used to have to fast Yomi Ashura. It used to be Wajib. Before Ramadan, they used to have to fast Yomi Ashura. One day, they didn't know about it until the middle of the day. Right When it first became obligatory, some of the Sahaba didn't know. The Prophet told them, stop eating from this moment and fast. And they were accepted their action. You see what I'm saying? Because the obligation followed their knowledge. He says, on Ma'mar and Ata al-Khurasani and Ibn Musayyib, the same thing. And he said that Ma'mar informed us about Ayyub, about Nafi', about Ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala an. أنه كان إذا كان السحاب أصبح صائما 
وإذا لم يكن سحاب أصبح مفطرا. Here we have a discrepancy. We've heard about if you see it fast, if you don't, don't. And if it's cloudy, do what? Count 30. But like we said, sometimes people do other things. And it doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean that they're, they just, maybe they didn't know the information or maybe they had an outside reason for doing it. The Salaf might disagree. He says, on the authority of Ma'mur, on the authority of Ata, I'm sorry, on the authority of Ma'mur, on the authority of Ayyub, on the authority of Nafi', on the authority of Ibn Umar. Ay Nafi' is telling us about Ibn Umar. He said that if he woke up and it was cloudy the night before, he would fast. I.e., in before Ramadan. If he woke up on the 29th night, right, I'm sorry, the 30th night, the night going into the 30th day, and it was cloudy, he would consider the month of Ramadan was over. I'm sorry, he would consider the month of Sha'ban was over, and he would fast the day of doubt. Ibn Umar would fast the day of doubt. And he said if it was no clouds, then he wouldn't fast. If he knew for sure there was no clouds and the moon wasn't saw, then he would not fast. But if he was in doubt, he would fast. So Ibn Umar is doing something contrary to the hadith. The hadith said, don't fast. But Ibn Umar would. Why? We said maybe he didn't know. Or maybe he had conflicting evidence. Meaning that, how many days do you know for sure in, in Shaban? No. 29 for sure. 30 is the day of doubt. And so maybe the moon is there. And they used to say, for me, fasting a day of Shaban is better than missing a day of Ramadan. So I'm going to do that. But is that the religion? You say no. Because here we have a companion going against the messenger. Who do we listen to? The messenger, Salah Salam. And we love Ibn Umar. And we said everything we said about the Sahaba in the beginning, showing that we have to follow their way. But who was before them? Allah and his messenger. And so even though Ibn Umar would do it, he had his reason. It's not hard for me to fast. It's not a big deal. It's just a day. I can do that easy. And I would rather fast this day than miss a day of Ramadan. We say, no, Ibn Umar. The Prophet forbade us from fasting this day. And in reality... Is that day that they're unsure about a day of Ramadan? No, because Ramadan doesn't start until the people say it starts. So even if the moon was there, or even if you saw it by yourself and nobody believed you, is it Ramadan? It's not Ramadan until the people acknowledge it's Ramadan. The prophet said your day of fasting is the day the people fast. Aisha, as we're going to read soon, she said that the fasting is the day the imam fasts and the majority of the people. There's no room for doubt or suspicion in it. Now, he says that, وَأَنْ مَعْمَرْ أَنْ طَاوُوسْ أَنْ أَبِيهِ مِثْلَ أَنْ أَبِنِي طَاوُوسْ أَنْ أَبِيهِ مِثْلَ Likewise, somebody else who would fast the day of doubt is طاوُوسْ, the tabi'i. He says on the author and Ibn Uyayna and Al-Ala Ibn Abdul Rahman Ibn Ya'qub and Abihi and Abi Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal Ida kana nis min Sha'ban fa'aftar He said that Ibn Uyayna said that Al-Ala Ibn Abdul Rahman Ibn Ya'qub said about his father who said about Abu Hurairah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it got halfway in Sha'ban he would break his fast he wouldn't fast anymore Halfway through the month of Shaban, it's no more fasting, right? Meaning, disconnect Ramadan from the month before. Now, there's another narration that says the Prophet would fast the most he would fast outside of Ramadan in Shaban. And it would only be a couple of days that he wouldn't fast. But some of them say the way you put these two together is that if you weren't fasting all of Shaban before, you can't fast after the 15th. If you weren't 
in the habit of constantly fasting all of Shaban, don't start after the 15th. There's no training for Ramadan. There's no let me get ready for Ramadan by fasting, right? You have to disconnect between it and the month before. قال أخبرنا داود بن قيس قال سألت القاسم بن محمد عن صيام اليوم الذي يشك فيه من رمضان قال إذا كان مغيما يتحرى أنه من رمضان فلا يصم فلا يصم He says that uh, uh, Dawood ibn Qais informed us about Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad is Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Right? And Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr is one of the seven scholars of Medina of his time. One of the fuqaha al sabah He said that uh, uh, I asked uh, Qasim ibn Muhammad about fasting the day that the people are in doubt. Is it from Ramadan? He said, if it was clouds and the people are trying to figure out was it Ramadan or not, then do not fast it. If it was cloudy and you couldn't see and you got some people saying, yeah, it is Ramadan and some people saying, no, it wasn't Ramadan and everybody's trying to figure it out, don't fast that day. قال أنا بن جريج قال قلت لي أطاء رجل مسافر دخل قرية وقد أصبح مفترى ولكنه لم يذق شيئا قال يتم آه here's another issue y'all not gonna like this one ابن جر عبد الرزاق said about ابن جريج who said I said to أطاء a person who's traveling he enters a city when you're traveling, what can you do? You don't have to fast. Don't have to fast. Why don't you have to fast? Because you're traveling. He says he enters a city. I.e., he enters a city, he's no longer traveling. What does he do? You were traveling earlier in the day. You get home. What do you do? Can you keep eating or do you got to stop fasting? Hold on. Do you keep eating? You, you're home, you fast. No, what you said earlier, All right. He says that, Alta, he said, he says a person, now, actually, y'all y'all would like this one. Never mind. It's a different. He said, I thought it was going somewhere else, but I, I missed the sentence. He says that Alta said a person was traveling, then he eat, enters the city, but he hasn't tasted anything yet. He was not fasting. How you doing? I mean, what's going on? Fuddle. Take a seat. You Muslim? No, sir. You try to become a Muslim? Yes, sir. Come on, take a seat right here next to me. What's your name, fam? Huh? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. MashaAllah, how'd you hear about Islam? Um, a guy that works in Take a seat, relax. Uh, a seat. Store, Nebraska store. Uh -huh. hey, uh, he told me to come. I've been talking to him about it. MashaAllah, so you, you think about being a Muslim? Yeah. You want to see more about it? And you got any questions? I'd rather just learn first, try to learn and catch the belief. No, no, you can't offer something to drink. Well, hold on. Now you choose. <laughs> Not for him. Not for him, but you can't help him do that. Qalu ma fi saqar. Right? The non Muslim doesn't have to fast. But are they held accountable for it? Yeah. Allah says that on the day of judgment, what got you all into the hellfire? What got into the hellfire? We didn't used to make salat. Right? So they're held accountable for what they don't do, even though we don't force them to do it. Right? But anyway, that's a, a different thing. The main thing to know about Islam is who do we worship? Allah said in the Quran, and I did not create mankind or the jinn and mankind except to worship me. Do you believe that there's anybody else worthy of worship besides Allah? No. Do you know who Allah is? Yes, sir. Mumtaz. Mm -hmm. When it comes to worshiping Allah, if we believe that Allah is the only one we worship, and we're not in doubt about that, the only question left is, is to figure out what is worship. And to know what worship is, we have to know who our prophet was, who was the messenger that was sent to us. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And we sent to every nation a messenger telling the people, worship Allah and avoid false idols. And so the messenger is the one who tells us what the worship of Allah is. And our messenger, the messenger, the last messenger was the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who was born maybe around almost 1500 years ago. It's not Elijah Muhammad or Fard Muhammad or any of the Muhammads that we hear like the Nation of Islam and things like that. It was the messenger who was from the descendants of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. And he came with the confirmation of the religion of Abraham. The religion of Abraham was the religion of Adam, the religion of Noah, the religion of Moses, the religion of Jesus. All of them were on the same religion. Allah says in the Quran, Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, right? Because the Jewish people came after him and the Christian people came after him. Allah says instead he was one who turned away from idolatry and was a Muslim. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is one who renewed that religion, who brought back the people from worshiping idols and worshiping people. Straighten your brother, he's praying the wrong way. That's not the, this is not the Qibli, yeah, it's like that, inshallah. Mumtaz, he got it, he got it, he got it. So the religion of Abraham was the religion of the Prophet Muhammad, and he is the one, the last messenger that was sent. Do you know who the Prophet Muhammad is? You don't know anything about him? Okay, no problem. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was born in the Arabian Peninsula about, like we said, about 1500 years ago. And he was unable, he grew up amongst a group of people who used to worship idols. But Allah chose him to renew the religion of Islam because every prophet before him, you know Jesus and you know Moses, we grew up knowing about them here in America. Yeah, go ahead. My bad you good, you good, fam. So, uh, you believe Jesus is a prophet? Absolutely. And, uh, you don't, so you don't believe Jesus and God is the same? Not at all. Okay. Allah says in the Quran about Jesus, in the method of Isa, in the Allah, he method of Adam. خلقه من تراب ثم قال له كن فيكون. Allah says the example of Jesus with Allah is like the example of Adam. Allah created Adam from dirt, and then He said to him, "Be." And he became. So we believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born miraculously of a virgin. And to be a Muslim, you have to love Jesus and you have to love his mother Mary. We believe in them and we love them. The difference is, is that we don't worship them. Allah says in the Quran, don't you see that Jesus and his mother both ate and drank? Didn't Mary used to eat and drink food? Didn't Jesus eat and drink food? Exactly. Does Allah need to eat or drink? No, God. God don't eat or drink. So how could Jesus be God? Jesus used to pray. Jesus used to ask Allah for assistance. And we say Allah because that's what Jesus called him. Allah. Yeah, absolutely. The language Jesus spoke, they still call him Allah today. Right? The issue is, is that people have lost sight of that, especially us here in the West. We say God, 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 and we forget who Allah was. So is that, is that, my bad. We're good. Yeah. Mm, you, you, that's, we here just talking. I ain't so no cutting off. Is that a disrespectful term to use when you say God? I try to avoid it. The reason I try to avoid it because the word God is actually from Old English. Norris, you know, the Norris, the Vikings. Oh, uh, yeah. And they used King to worship Norris. before King James, like the Vikings, you know, like Thor and stuff like that. We watched Bar like who was Thor's father? Uh, Zeus. No, like Zeus was Greek or Roman. Right. Thor's father was the person they used to call Odin. Okay, yeah. yeah. Odin, that's how we say it now. There used to be different ways to pronounce it. One of them was Got. So was Zeus brother? I mean, was Thor's brother Loki? Yeah, Thor brother was Loki, right? These are gods they used to worship. Now we don't worship them, but these those group of people used to worship these gods. So the word God comes from the word God, which was the name of their big God, okay. right? But that's not Allah's name. Allah says, biha." 
And to Allah is the best of names. So talk about him using them or worship him using them. Allah is the creator, the owner, the controller, the giver of life and death, the first, the last, the originator, the one who has love, the one who has compassion, the swift in his mercy. I'm sorry, the swift in his punishment. Allah has names that he told us about himself. And that's what we use when we talk about him. From the things that he never called himself was the word God. Now, in English, nowadays, the word God just means something that is worshipped. And Allah is something that is worshipped. We worship Allah. Right? There are other gods besides Allah. Other things that people worship. Right? Hindus, they worship a cow. To the Hindus, the cow is God. Because God means something worship. Al-Ilah means something worship. But a Muslim, our main statement is La ilaha illallah. There's nothing that deserves worship except Allah. Except Allah, right? Do people worship other things? And these other things are gods. People worship them. It's only one God that deserves the worship. What is it? Because this is where the language becomes important. What does God mean? Anything that's worshipped. If you worship something, it's a God. Right? If somebody worships it, they've taken it as their, their God. But what God deserves worship? What thing that is worship deserves it? Allah. Why does Allah deserve worship? Who created us? Allah, the cow that the Hindus worship, did it create us? No. So they worship it. It's their God. Does it deserve it? No. Go ahead. Would that be considered like Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost? So this is something that the Christians and the Jews before them, and this is like, I tell you, language is very important because a lot of the mistakes that the people before us made is because they didn't understand language. And language is how you like realize the intellect and the smartness of a group of people. The Christians and the Jews before them, they used to say that they were God's children. And so God would be their what? Their father. Allah says in the Quran, How could he have any children when he doesn't have any mate? Is there anything comparable to Allah? Is there anything else like him? No. no. So how could he have children when he doesn't have a mate to give birth to them? Allah says in the Quran, and this is one of the greatest surahs in the Quran. Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the only one. There's only one. Allahu samad. Allah who doesn't break apart into pieces, right? He doesn't have any ability to separate this and that. Like you, you can have children. Your semen comes out, Allah, you have children. Allah is a summit. He doesn't have an end. It's, he's whole, one. He doesn't, let me yell it. He, birth, he wasn't born. Does he have any parents? Does Allah have a parent? No, he was before everything. He's the first. And he doesn't have any children. And there's nothing else like him. Is Jesus God because he didn't have a father? Mary was a virgin. She got pregnant. That is absolutely true. But when we look at Eve, did Eve have a mother? Adam and Eve, right? right, right. Eve was created from what? From Adam's did she have a mother? No. Adam was created from what? Did he have a mother or a father? No. You have a mother and a father, but you came from a fluid that's dirty and nasty. If it got on your clothes, you would wash them. Is any one of those types of creation less miraculous? 
Is any one of them less amazing than the other? No. You were born from a mother and a father. Isn't that just as amazing? If I take some semen and put it in a cup and put an egg in a cup and shake it up real hard, a baby gonna pop up? Mm -hmm. No. It's no less amazing. You were in your mother's stomach for nine months. A piece of flesh. A, a, a blood clot. Then a piece of flesh. Then you got bones. Allah covered those bones. You grew. You gestated inside of her body. You got hearing and seeing. You came out. She didn't die. Then she fed you and you grew up. You got strong. You learned. How amazing is that? Does that make you God's child? That just makes you one of his creations. You're no less miraculous than the sky. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, أَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا أَمِ السَّمَاءِ بَنَاهَا رَفَعَ سَمْكَهَا فَسَوَّاهَا وَأَخْطَشَ لَيْلَهَا وَأَخْرَجَ ضُحَاهَا Are you harder to create or the sky? Allah says, رَفَعَ سَمْكَهَا He raised it up and leveled it out. And he brought out the day and the night. Is the sky Allah's child? No, it's the sky. And so this term of calling themselves children, it got misinterpreted and Allah knows best. We are Allah's creation, his slaves, his servants. And it's not far-fetched. We do what we're told. God tells you to do something, what do you do? You try to do it. That's like a slave to its master. Allah is our master. Allah is our owner. And we are his slaves. We do what we're told. We try not to disobey. The word slave historically, what's another way they would call a slave? We know, it, especially black people. How do they call us? A boy, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody call you a boy. How you feel about that? Mm. It's disrespectful, right? Because that's how they used to talk to their slaves. Hey, boy, come here, bring this, right? The word for boy in Arabic, there's a lot of them. Ibn, Ghulam, Walid. And that's how they would talk to their slaves, right? So it's not far-fetched. And it doesn't mean it's the case, but it's not far-fetched to believe that in lost in translation, the word slave of God became boy of God. And that became son of God. But did he give birth to it? Like, Think about it. Jesus, peace be upon him. He told Mary to get pregnant. She got pregnant. He didn't have sex with Mary. Actually, that's impossible, right? That's Roman and Greek mythology. That God would have sex with a person. Right? And so, now you understand about Allah a little bit better. Do you think there's anybody else that deserves to be worshipped besides him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And his prophet Muhammad is the one who taught us all of this stuff. And the more you learn about him and what he taught, the more you know about what Allah wants. And so if you believe in those things, don't waste time. Accept Islam. Accept Islam today. I've been where you're at. I wasn't raised. I was born in New York. I grew up here in St. Louis. I'm from U-City. I accepted Islam when I was 13. This young man right here. What's your name, Ah? Jalen. Jalen. He just accepted Islam today, too. Don't waste time. I can guarantee you, take it from one who's experienced. It's the best thing you can do. It's the truth. It is 100% the truth. All it requires from you is to learn it and practice it. And that's what's going to take the effort. But the good news is, is that you have brothers here in this masjid and in Muslims in general who will always be there with Allah's permission to help make it easy. But don't waste time. If you believe in Allah, don't waste time thinking about it. Accept Islam. You said you came here wanting to accept Islam. You, and, and, and bear in mind, we don't get any commission, right? A lot of people, they think, well, why is he telling me to accept Islam? He's pressuring me. We don't get any check at, behind. There's nobody back there waiting for a check for new members. I'm just telling you what I know is good because I want the good for you that I experience. I used to be in similar, I don't know your, your life story, 
but I can guarantee you we're from the same places. We did the same things. We know the same type of people. And I can guarantee you my life is better with Islam. And it's not just because it's structure and it's organization, but it's because I'm worshiping the one who created me. And when we look at the skies and we see how perfect they are, why are they perfect? Why is the earth perfect? Why is the animals perfect? Because they do what they're told. Allah told them to do something, they don't disobey. The sun comes up every morning, why? Because Allah told it, and it's a perfect sunrise. And it sets every night, why? Because Allah told it, and it's a perfect sunset. And my life is perfect to the extent that I do what Allah told me. And the only time my life isn't perfect, because I'm a human, is when I don't do what he said. And that's what it means to be a Muslim, to try to do what he told you as much as you can. And only worship him. So I encourage you, man, if you want to be a Muslim, I can tell you what to say to become a Muslim. Or if you have any other questions, go ahead. I mean, I can't listen to the... Oh, yeah, you're more than welcome to listen to the class. But I'll, I'll say it again. My suggestion is don't delay. But you want to just listen to our class? Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah, of course, no problem. And if you have any questions, any interjections, feel free to, to talk. And by the way, my name's Hakeem. This side. Yes. Huh? Hassan. There's too many Hassans. Adam. Adam. Huh? Yeah, I seen. This brother walking away. I don't know his name. Who's that in the back? Shafi. Shafi. And then the brother who just went inside is Abdul Vahid. You got any questions or anything like that? Just feel free to interject, interrupt. The class that we're doing right now, it's a, it's a class that is specific for Muslims about how we fast Ramadan. So Muslims, one of the things that's unique about Islam compared to the other religions is that Islam covers every aspect of life, not just worship, like what we think praying and things like that, but even to the smallest details of how we use the bathroom. Islam tells us the do's and don'ts about every aspect of our life, marriage, business, belief, prayer, fasting, what to eat, things like that. And so Islam covers everything. And one of the things that separates Islam from the other religions is that the information is still here. It was preserved. So like when it comes to Christianity, if I tell a person to do what Jesus said, it'd be very, really hard. Because do we have any information that Jesus actually said left in his language? When we look at the Bible, for example, it's all in Greek and Roman, Latin. Did Jesus speak Greek or Latin? So the things that we have that they say are from Jesus, they are translations of somebody's retelling of the story. And like we all played the game telephone back in, in grade school. I tell you something, you tell by the time it gets back around, never. it's never the same. And that's how their scripture is. Right. Because a lot of it has been lost and altered. If I tell somebody to do, do what Moses said. Yeah, they got the Bible, but the Bible is in what language? It's in English. And the translation from English was from Greek and Latin and maybe Hebrew. But who are the people that told us that information? What were their personalities? Were they honest? Were they trustworthy? Right. How was their memory? Because they're telling me God said something. I need to know. Are you sure? Did he say it this way or did he say it a different way? Did he say son or slave? That small word can change the whole religion. So one of the things that's unique about Islam is that all of our religion is preserved. We have the Quran, the Quran that we read, it's in Arabic. And it's the same Quran today that it was when it was revealed over 1400 years ago. Nothing has changed. Not only is the Quran preserved, but separate, the statements of the prophet are preserved and his explanation of the Quran. And likewise, the statements of his companions is preserved. The people who learned from him, like the disciples. And we know all of their identities. We know their biographies, their stories. All of that is preserved because our scholars took great effort to make sure it's preserved every generation. 
And if we come across somebody we don't know, then we don't take their information out of the possibility that maybe they forgot or maybe they were untrustworthy. So our religion has a strong connection to being able to verify what we believe and what we do. And so this class that we're doing now is getting some of the companions of the prophet, their understanding of the religion to help us better understand it the way they did. So we have the Quran. The Quran, for example, tells a Muslim that we have to fast the month of Ramadan. And the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he educated us how to fast the month of Ramadan. And then this book helps us to see how his companions, his friends, understood his teachings. So we can check our understanding with theirs so that we don't make up something new in the religion. And so that's what we're going over right now. Like I said, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to ask. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask. What are, uh, I know it's probably not on your subject, but... I'll, I'll be on subject? Yeah. Death. And uh, what are you, uh, what's the belief on death? And uh, after death, after life? Allah says, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt. Every individual is going to taste death. There's no escaping it. Right? Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, uh, what's the ayat in Baqarah? Not, not, when kuntum fi raybam mimma nazalna. What's the ayat, ya akhan, um, in Baqarah? Huwa alladhi khalaqakum thumma yumitukum thumma yuhyikum thumma ilahi turja'un. What's the ayat? Khalaqakum thumma yuhyikum. Yuhyikum. Subhanallah, my review is weak right now. Thumma yumitukum. Right down into my tongue. Allah says, ah, Allah says, Kayfa takfuruna billahi wa kuntum amwata. How can you disbelieve in Allah? And you were dead, you didn't exist. Thumma yuhyikum. And then He brought you to life. Thumma yumitukum. And then He's going to cause you to die again. Thumma ilayhi turja'un. And then you're going to go back to Him. Uh, you're going to return to Him and be held accountable for your actions. So we believe that everybody's going to die. It has to happen. And that death, after we die, we're going to be resurrected. And we're going to be held accountable for the actions that we did on this earth. Allah says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَى So whoever does the smallest act of good on that day, i.e. the day of judgment, he'll see it, I, he'll get paid back for it, he'll be compensated with reward for it. And whoever does the smallest act of evil on that day, he'll see it, i.e. he'll be compensated for it, he'll be punished for it. So we believe that we're going to die, and we believe that we're going to be resurrected, and we believe that we're going to be held accountable. And this is one of the six pillars of our faith. Our faith is based upon six major components that we believe in Allah, that we believe in the angels, that we believe in the books that Allah revealed, all of them, that we believe in the messengers, that we believe all of the prophets, we have to believe in all of them, and that we believe in the day of judgment, and that we believe in predestination, things that we think are good and things that we perceive as bad. All of it, Allah was in control of it. These six pillars are the cornerstone of Islam. And the most important of these two is faith in Allah and faith in the day of judgment. Faith in the life after death. Because that's what we're all working for. This life is temporary. Mata'un. It's an enjoyment that even if we lived a thousand years, it would end. Allah says, وَإِنَّ الْآخِرَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ وَلَدَارُ الْآخِرَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ But the next life is the true life, if they only knew. And so this is what motivates the Muslim to do good and to stay away from doing bad. Because no matter what I enjoy or suffer in this life, it's only temporary. And the worst thing that can happen to me in this life is I could die. Right? But if I lived a good life, dying isn't that bad. Because Allah is going to compensate me for the good that I did. So a Muslim has a strong belief in death. 
Not a belief that he's scared of it necessarily. He has fear of it because I'm not sure, am I good enough? I'm not sure did my sins, are they gonna hold me down? But at the same time, I hope that Allah is going to forgive me and have mercy on me because of how I try. And so the Muslim is between fear and hope. We worship not being comfortable like everything is cool, don't worry about it, but not at the same point in time being so scared that we are inactive. Because we're scared, we try harder. And because we hope, we're not as scared. And so this is kind of like some of the things that we believe about regarding death and how we approach it. Play. Uh, going back to the book of fasting. So the author, he said, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we mentioned the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said when it was the middle of the month of Sha'ban, then stop fasting. We said this is because the Salaf, they wouldn't let you connect Ramadan to another month. You should separate between the fasting of Ramadan and every other month. It shouldn't be connected. It should be fast Ramadan and before it and after it, you shouldn't fast directly. The next statement he says, Qala akhbaru. No, we did that. Uh, uh, he says, Qala akhbaru Ibn Juraid. No, we did that too. Uh, now, we said that Ibn Juraid, he said that Atta said about a man who was traveling, if he enters the city, the person was traveling. We know that the traveler can break his fast. So if the traveler has the intention of not fasting, but then he enters the city, but he hasn't eaten anything yet. What does he have to do? Alta, he said, he cannot fast the rest of the day and that's good enough. He doesn't have to make it up. He can, as long as he hasn't eaten yet, when he gets to the city, he can make his intention to fast from that moment and he doesn't have to make it up. And this is that same point that we were making, which is, the obligation or the intention starts with the obligation. As long as you haven't eaten or drinking or had intercourse before the obligation, then you can fast from that moment and it counts towards that day of Ramadan. He says, this narration is about the person, if you guys remember in the narration of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he said, if you had eaten before you knew it was Ramadan, and then you found out it was Ramadan, you have to fast the rest of the day. Somebody might say, well, why do you have to fast the rest of the day? Right? You've already eaten and it was halal to eat and you have to make that day up. Why do you have to fast the rest of the day? Fumble. I have time to run water. Is it time? How oh, it's only two minutes. You know what? We'll stop now because it's almost time for iftar. So we'll stop now. We only got two minutes, inshallah. We'll, we'll pick back up next week, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha 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 ilaha